Welcome back to the Red Dice Diaries RPG podcast with John and Hannah. Hi. And today we're going to be having a look at some of the voicemail messages that our listeners have kindly sent in. And our first voicemail message is from Colin Green at the Spike Pit podcast. Take it away, Colin. Hey, Hannah. I'll have to keep my voice down, but I've only got one story about wishes that I can recall, and that was pretty recent in an old school game. The uh, DM's a bit of a tricky bugger, and there was I thinking I'd get myself a big old magical, shiny dwarven battle axe, but what he didn't tell anyone was he needed to get some of his backstory out because it's a streamed game, and he spent all this time on it. So what... What I think happened was he slipped one of the players before the session, he, he slipped him a little uh, payment on PayPal to ask about the background for the campaign. So, <laughs> of course, he stepped in there and asked all about the history. Would you believe it? Tricky bugger. Hi, Colin. I, I might know the GM in question, and I find it hard to believe that he'd bribe one of his players with money through PayPal because I know how stingy he is. Yo, John, what up? I just want to drop you a quick message, let you know I am loving your YouTube series on the different types of villains. Each episode has just been really chock full of information and really just really fun and useful stuff there, man. Great, great job. Also, I'm listening to the most recent episode of Blood and Snow. I think it's episode six. And I'm wondering why you switched uh, VTTs in the middle of a in the middle of a campaign. Uh, Maybe you talked about it in the audio dungeon but I'm not in there much anymore. So if that's something you want to talk about, that'd be awesome. Maybe you already have. Anyway, dude, loving your stuff. Peace out. That was Joe from the Hind Cyclist podcast. Thank you very much for getting in touch, Joe. I'm glad you're enjoying the villain episodes that I'm putting out on YouTube. Because of time pressures, I can't really get them out on a regular schedule like we do with the podcast. But, you know, when I've got a spare moment, I'm trying to like put out the episodes for that. And I'm hoping to do a good few more of them. As for your question about the VTT, I'm perfectly happy to talk about it. Um, I'd been finding recently, when I was using Roll20, that we've been experiencing quite a lot of lag on it, which is presumably due to the influx of people going onto their servers for obvious reasons. And we'd had quite a few game sessions where people had like clicked to roll a dice and we'd be sat there for like two minutes waiting for it to roll up or we'd be sat there waiting for maps to load up and stuff like that. So I started scouting around for a a virtual tabletop that would allow me to have that similar experience to Roll20 with a control system for the players that wasn't much more difficult and was fairly similar, but that wouldn't have these problems with lagging. Now, as I'm sure you're aware, my, um, my old colleague from my Purple Worm days, Pete Jones, has put out a number of videos on his great YouTube channel where he's looking at various VTTs and I consulted them and a number of different sources as well. And after sort of examining a few different ones, it seemed to me that the Foundry VTT was more what I was looking for because it's hosted on my computer so it doesn't have to rely on like the sort of creaking servers of Roll20 and it's a one-off payment. Now, Up until I cancelled it recently, I had a a paid account for Roll20 because I thought, well, I've been using it so long, I probably should throw them a few pounds. But obviously that's a monthly payment. And I found that certainly with the recent performance drops, I wasn't really getting bang for my buck, I suppose you could say. So I switched everything over to Foundry. Luckily, there was um, an old school essential system module and there's like a a sort of compendium that has all the core monsters and stuff like that. So that was uh, fairly quick to do. And there was a few modules I was able to download that replicated the functionality of stuff you could do on Roll20. So like 3D dice, pinging on the map and stuff like that. And what I did originally before moving over fully was I was like, right, I'll, I'll set up the stuff I need for next session. We'll play one session, see how it goes. If it doesn't go well, then no harm, no foul, we can go back to Roll20. If it does go well, I'll then cancel my 
my sort of paid account for Roll20, dropping it back down to the free account, and we'll carry on on Foundry. And the first session of Old School Essentials went really great. Everyone seemed to enjoy it. Everyone was very complimentary about how Foundry worked, and no one seemed to have any like real problems with it. So I decided, yep, yeah, let's make the choice and move over. And I know we've only done one session with it, but I've not regretted it. I've started up another game of White Star, which is going to be using Foundry, and that we're doing our first session of that soon. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what else I can get out of the system. So, long story short, because Foundry's cheaper. See what I mean, Colin? Hi, Hannah. Hi, John. Goblin Senchman here. So, quickly on Needlemen. They're a great favourite of mine, actually. Um, they sort of almost re- remind me of something you might find on a uh, Iron Maiden album cover. <laughs> um, but I'm very fond of the humanoid form. I don't know about all this newfangled um, prey mantis um, drawing of them. They, they twisted most of my favourite monsters over time. Umberhulks, I like the sort of stocky, kind of almost beetle-like version of the the Umberhulk and you know things like that. Anyway, but um, the other thing I would say is, um, oh yes, on publishing, you were saying you're dipping your toe into that area. Yeah, I, I would say go for it. I'm sure you've got some great ideas to share, and um, I think with all these things, um, you you know you learn on the job. I'm by no means a fantastic publisher or anything, but Certainly, over time, I started with one one publication called The Master's Horde. Um, back, it was a sort of I put it out on Free RPG Day or something. Um, and I look back at that and I think, well, obviously, I could have made improvements and whatnot. But um, I'm not, again, I'm, not, I'm certainly not you know up, up there with the the greats and layout and whatnot. But I certainly have learned a few tricks going along. So I think the only thing I would say is go for it, and you'll you know you'll pick up things as you go. I think like all things, you learn on the job. <laughs> All right. Cheers. Bye. Thanks, Goblin Henchman. Really glad you enjoyed the Needleman episode. It's an interesting point that you make about the difference of artwork over different editions. And I never let myself feel constrained by which edition I'm running as to which artwork I like the aesthetic of. But then I often try and put my own campaigns together with like my own campaign world. So... I have a lot more control over that aesthetic. Whereas when you're trying to fit with a world that someone else has already created, you have to sort of fit it to their idea. And if you said we're doing 4th edition D&D exactly as 4th edition D&D, you then have to sort of go with the artwork as it is in the 4th edition, and so on and so forth. It's all part of the game when you first construct it and how you and your players approach it together yeah and uh, thank you very much for your encouragement with regards to the publishing side of things goblins henchmen that's very kind of you i've now put um mm-hmm. my adventure the little barbershop of terror up on drive through it's pay what you want and uh, the feedback's been pretty positive a few people have pointed out a few errors and mistakes with it which is great because i've been able to correct them because obviously it's a it's a download so i can upload an updated edition and like you say i'm hoping as i sort of do a few more bits and pieces i'll sort of learn on the job and get better through doing it so thank you very much for your call that's greatly appreciated Hey, Hannah, I hope you get feeling better. John said you're under the weather, and I'm just wishing you the best. Take care. Thanks, Jason. That was really good of you. Uh, Yeah, we've had a crappy few weeks recently, and this is why some of our episodes have been a bit late, or sometimes we've skipped an episode here or there. We are trying to keep up with the schedule, but obviously real life does have to sort of take precedent. Thanks ever so much for your encouragement. It's really good to know that you guys are behind us. Yeah, I mean, as Hannah said, we we both try and get together to do these episodes, and it can sometimes be a bit challenging with our work schedule. And as as we know, on sort of like a larger scale, everything's quite chaotic and sort of a bit up in the air at the minute. So sometimes it's difficult, or we're just like too tired, or one of us isn't available. So. We, we we do our best to keep up with it, but as Hannah said, we we do appreciate the the well wishes, and we're trying to sort of keep to the schedule as much as we can. So thank you very much. That was of course Jason from the Nerds RPG Variety Cast. 
So let's see who's up next. Hi, Hannah. Hi, John. Just listen to your sons of Cayuse. I think I've always said cuss, but um, fair enough. Or thought it, at least. Um, it's been in my mind, um, my theme folio for a long time. I've always kind of enjoyed the picture, but for some reason I've never read it. It seems to be sort of a, a zombie with a with an inbuilt sort of rot, rot grub thing going on. Um, so, yeah, thanks for that. That's interesting. Um, I thought Hannah said an interesting thing, which was the, uh, the thing about, and I've thought about this before, you know, why insert, I can understand the rationale behind, behind hit points when you're in a fight, but when a rock grubs under your skin, why is it not, why is it doing the same proportional damage? And I've always thought in those scenarios, instead of rolling D6, you know, D2 or whatever each time, you roll D hit dice. So f- for a, for a magic user, it's a D4 damage per round, for a fighter, it's a D10. So it's kind of doing a proportional damage to your hit dice base. Um, so essentially, it's doing a, a sixth of your de- your or proportional to your base. Um, incidentally, I've also <laughs> made a hex flower a hex flower called "Where Did the Rot Grub Go Next?" Um, and the idea is the rot grub's trying to get to your heart to kill you. Well, of course, for a son of Caius, you could do "Where Did the, Where Did the Where Did the the Grub Go Next?" and it's going for your um, instead of your heart, it's going for your brain, I believe. Anyway, different way of doing it, but sort of. A mini game in a game. Cheers. Thanks. That was, of course, Goblin's Henchman again. Thank you very much for calling in. If you've not checked out Goblin's Henchman's Hex Flowers on the Drive Through RPG website, I highly advise you to do that. He's got some great stuff on there. And I think you make a very interesting point, Goblin's Henchman, as did Hannah in the episode. And we see quite often in D and D that like certain things will be certainly in the earlier versions, certain things will be abstracted to like hit points or very simple systems, purely for the purposes of simplicity. Whereas other things get like a little mini game or they get like a dice roll, so you know, like foraging for food and stuff like that. You get a couple of D six rolls you can make for that. You make your D six roll to see if you get lost when you're navigating in the wilderness. Whereas some of the stuff's abstracted away. And I think as you were saying, you could certainly if you wanted to like focus in a bit more on these grubs these worms of chaos invading someone's body you could certainly use a hex flower or your proportional hit points idea to have sort of a mini game representing that i just think really it's down to how much the gm wants to focus on that aspect if you're running the sort of game you know it's like kicking the door going into the combat and you don't want to focus on the sort of parasitic side of things then you may just want to stick to the hit points. If, however, you want to delve into that sort of body horror like vibe of that a bit more, I think, yeah, a mini game or a slightly different way of doing it is a great idea. They're going to just say, like, oh, I'll keep coming along because it's something we can do on a local herbalist. Okay. Hey, Hannah and John. I'm going to pull a John. I'm going to call you before the end of your, stop the podcast and call before the end of your podcast. Listen to your sons of, um, yeah, however you say that word, Caius episode. And so the movie you are thinking of, Hannah, and I'm sure you've researched this by now, is indeed Night of the Creeps. And I think what's important, it's a Fred um, Decker, Fred, shoot, Fred somebody um, movie. And so the interesting thing about him is, though, he also did the amazing Monster Squad, which I'm sure you've seen Monster Squad or have fond memories of Monster Squad. And if you don't, then, you know, two demerits to you. But the yeah night of the creeps is what you're thinking of which of course has tom atkins and his mustache as the the lead detective and he has that great line he picks up the phone you know when his phone rings he picks up the phone goes thrill me and um yeah night of the creeps is a interesting 80s kind of mashup movie um fred decker d-e-k-k-e-r but yeah that's what you're thinking of anyway talk to you later many thanks jason I thought it probably was that film. It's been a long old time since I've seen it, but I have added it to my movies to find list. Yeah, thanks very much, Jason. That was, of course, Jason from the Nerds RPG Variety Cast. So that's it for this short uh, voicemail episode. Thank you to all our excellent callers, to Colin from Spike Pit, Jason from Nerds RPG Variety Cast, Goblin's Henchman, and of course 
Joe from Hindsightless. If you'd like to get in touch with us and leave a voicemail, perhaps appearing in a future episode, you can do so by using the SpeakPipe website. There's a link in the description of this episode. Or you can send us an email to rddrpgpodcast at gmail.com. Until we speak to you again, take care, stay safe, and happy gaming. Bye.